Hello, everyone. My name is Robert Winfrey, and what you're about to listen to is an old episode of a podcast I used to host called Everyone Loves a Bad Guy. This episode, as we kick off the month of October here in 2022, originally aired October 11th, 2013. And the premise was a discussion about hauntings, haunted houses, haunted people. Uh, Haunted people hadn't quite become as big a thing, a trend at that point as it is now. But we still discuss a little bit. That, uh, my guest for this episode is Sean Comer. And we get to kick around that idea. Now, I mentioned the air date, in, not just for purposes of historical accuracy, but also so that you all understand, there is no discussion of two shows that would have taken up a lot of time, maybe not all of it, but a lot of it, had they been out when the episode was recorded. Uh One of those, of course, being the 2018 series, uh, The Haunting of Hill House by Mike Flanagan, and the follow-up, The Haunting of Bly Manor, uh, both of which deal with these kinds of themes uh, very explicitly, and are really, really good television shows. Um, Bly Manor's a slightly different... It's still good, it's just different. Uh, Point being, I assure you, Sean and I would have devoted a lot of time to discussing those... Uh, seasons of television series, they're both singular, had we had access to them at the time, but again, this was five years before they ever saw air, so you work with what you have. Consequently, you get a discussion of, you know, Poltergeist, the Amityville, horror, uh, some of the classics as far as that goes. Uh, All right, so thank you very much for listening. Thank you for uh, any likes, comments, subscribes, anything like that that you can give us. Those all help tremendously when it comes to uh, keeping the shows afloat. Uh, Also helping keep the shows afloat, we have some sponsors, so let's give them some love. First up, Grammarly. For you listeners of the W2M Network, Grammarly is offering a free download of the Grammarly software. Grammarly's AI-powered products help people communicate more effectively. Grammarly helps you write mistake-free on Gmail, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and nearly anywhere else you write on the web. Grammarly corrects hundreds of grammar, punctuation, and spelling mistakes, while also catching contextual errors, improving your vocabulary, and suggesting style improvements. To download Grammarly today, go to getgrammarly.com slash W2M Network. Again, that's getgrammarly.com slash W2M Network to download Grammarly for free. There is a link in the description below. You can click on that as well if you'd rather not type. Also supporting the podcast, we have Amazon Music. The Amazon Music Unlimited service is the best music streaming service on the internet. I know that covers a lot of ground, but that's my thought on the matter, not just because they pay me. Uh, Well, they don't pay me specifically. They pay the network, and I still don't get paid. I am sad about that, but eh, what are you going to do? I do this for love more than anything else. Uh, but if you would like to try the unlimited service for the, over at Amazon Music, we're giving you a free 30 days of it. Go to getamazonmusic.com slash W2M Network. There's a link in the description below as well if you'd rather click that. After 30 days, you can decide for yourself if you want to keep it and start paying for it, or if it was just a really wonderful 30 days when you had access to over 70 million songs ad-free, uh, all courtesy of Amazon Music. So, and At which point, it's up to you whether or not you would like to continue the service. So give that a click if that's something you're interested in, and enjoy on us. It's free to you. You, There is no risk to you whatsoever, I promise. With that out of the way, let me throw it to myself, circa 2013, and Sean Comer to discuss hauntings. It's a wonderful topic, and we certainly do it a degree of justice. So enjoy the show, everybody. This is the life you see, the devil, this is half to me. 
and welcome to Everyone Loves a Bad Guy. I am your host, Robert Winfrey. I am very happy to have you guys here for the duration of this episode. Hopefully, if you listen, listen to the end, guys. It only gets better as time goes on, I promise. This week, uh, Horror Month, and I'm, I, I said it last week, and I'll say it again, there's a good chance many times over the course of this show and subsequent shows I'll refer to it as Halloween Month, and I apologize, but Horror Month is rolling on. And because it's October, because my birthday's in this month, because Halloween's this month, because all things horror go with the month of October, courtesy of pagan religions being somewhat adopted by Christianity. Yay! But tonight we are focusing specifically on an interesting uh, subgenre of horror, and that is hauntings. Haunted houses, haunted people, haunted objects in some cases. There's a lot of fun stuff to be had there, and... I think at the beginning of the show, I'm going to give my guest a chance to kind of comment on what we talked about last week a little bit, since we had a minor scheduling conflict. He was, we were hoping to get him here. He couldn't make it. It just, you know, scheduling issues happen, folks. And they happen frequently, especially if, you know, information is not adequately passed from one party to another. Like, was my case last week. I didn't give Sean enough information, so... But hey, you got me talking for about 80 minutes about slashers, and I do want to give Sean a chance to talk about some of those villains this week just to kick things off. But so I've mentioned him a couple of times. He's here for the first time. He will be here hopefully for the rest of the month and at other points in the future. He writes in the 411 Mania Music Zone. He is the celebrated co-host of The Long Road to Ruin with Mark Radlich and for this month myself. It's Sean Comer, ladies and gentlemen. Sean, welcome. And he damn near overslept this show this week. Hey, it happens sometimes, uh, especially especially if you work nights. You know, you just got to uh, crash during the but, day. Or, or with me being self-employed, as is the case, if you work pretty much any time you're awake. Um, so if I stumble over words, forget something, get a name wrong, please accept right now the fact that I didn't wake up until 10-6. Um I, I actually doze off trying to rewatch the penultimate Hellraiser movie. Um, It'll put you to sleep. No, it won't put you to sleep. I believe my exact thought that was rolling through my head was, why, 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 God, why? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a rough one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, no, but uh, it's it's great to be here, though. I, I listen to a lot of other podcasts, and I always think, oh, you know, I should really make arrangements to – Try to get on this show or get on that show just to shake things up, do a little something different. So here I am now with a cup of coffee and the sandwich that I'm fixing as we start the opening monologue. All right, sandwiches are good. I had one just before we, uh, just before I called into the show to get things rolling. So sandwiches are the great catch-all for whenever you're just kind of hungry but don't know what to fix. Sandwiches are usually good because they have so much variety. But just to kind of go up, uh, last week I was on here, I talked about slasher villains and... I just wanted to really quickly get your thoughts on your favorite slasher villain and maybe uh, just uh, – excluding Freddy Krueger because Freddy gets his own podcast. Uh, first of November is when we'll be doing that one. So just you your know, favorite one uh, just you know, really briefly since uh, you know I didn't tell you when to call in last week. So Sure, sure. That's fine. Uh, pretty easily my favorite slasher villain would be far and away – uh, Michael Myers, because this is going to sound kind of odd. Uh, <laughs> you can't really blame, you almost kind of can't blame the bad movies on the way he was portrayed. Just and on the way everybody, Yeah, he really is. I mean, you just kind of have to blame it on everything else around him. And you got to imagine that somewhere in the universe of fictional characters, even during the horrible, horrible abominations that were the fourth and fifth Halloween movies, he was just thinking, look, I just have to go along with this. Everybody, I'm sorry. I I have nothing to do with this. I'm just doing what they tell me. I I really, I feel, go, go ask for the refund. Go go ahead. I'll understand. (laughs) Oh, yeah, I... Yeah, I, well, one of the things that I mentioned last week, I don't know if you've listened to it, is that you know, you, as while Jason Voorhees may have surpassed Myers in terms of popularity and status and, you know, 
number of movies and n- amount of money made, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, Michael Myers was like the first one that came back for a second movie because all of the yeah. other slasher villains were kind of one and done. You know, what, the one thing you kind of have to say about Jason, though, Jason fell into a state of, of self-parody. Um, it, it, it got so bad that for so long the movies became uh, such absolute jokes for how formulaic they were and how predictable they were that finally the people who produced them just gave in and made Jason X and say, okay, fine, we're just going to make one big damn movie where we just laugh at ourselves. Which worked. I mean, Jason X is one of my favorite uh, Friday the 13th movies. I mean, not my favorite, of course. I mean, one and two are exceptionally great slasher movies and horror movies in general, but when you get past that, I mean, if you ever want to have fun, folks, watch Friday the 13th parts 2, 3, 4, and 5, I think it is. Because, like, 2, 3, and 4 all take place within hours of each other when you actually look at the chronology portrayed within the films. It's kind of crazy when you think about it. Well, and the thing is, though, is with Jason X, you have to remember that if you're following the proper story chronology, you have to set that entirely apart from every other movie because keep in mind, by this point, Jason has been sent to hell. Yeah. Yeah. He is uh, He is in the hereafter. In Jason X, <laughs> he, he's been sentenced to being cryogenically frozen. So somewhere in between, he's already been resurrected. So in almost every sense, it really is just and a part Friday the 13th parody movie that just kind of goes after every single trope of all of them. And the chronology really doesn't quite pick up again until Freddy vs. Jason. Yeah. But, but uh, yeah, I so yeah, I, I agree. You know, the, J, the Friday the 13th movies were a little too successful for their own good because they started churning them out with surprising regularity and... You got Jason being one of the first anti-heroes as far as slasher villains go, and that there were bad people trying to revive him, so he became the de facto good guy because he was killing people worse than him. Series really should have stuck to the final chapter. They really should have just made that movie exactly what what they said it would be. Oh, if only. But we're not here to talk slashers this week. This week we're talking about haunted locations, haunted houses, boxes, peoples, families, all kinds of fun stuff where, for one reason or another, usually completely beyond your own control, you find supernatural spirits or demons or what have you pestering your home life and just ruining a perfectly good house, a perfectly good subdivision, all kinds of things like that. Because, you know, they're restless spirits. They don't care about property values. And just within that vein, the one I want to start off with here is... Uh, One of my personal favorites within not just the genre, but kind of horror in general, uh, the movie Poltergeist, which is just, you know, it's one of my favorites when it comes to haunted house movies because it has a fair amount of atmosphere to go along with some of the crazy stuff. And there's crazy stuff in there, too, like a guy peeling his face off in the kitchen and looking at it in the mirror and still kind of somehow knowing it's all, it's not actually real, but you still react to that. And just, I like the story behind it as well. The whole thing kind of, flows in a very great way especially for a haunted house film so i'm you know you, you're kind of a horror fan like myself so i'm kind of assuming you've seen that one uh you know believe it or not i've seen the first one but i haven't really seen the sequels maybe but one time each um uh, really not, yeah, they're not yeah, that I, good yeah i i vaguely remember um catching my because i mean you you youngins, you rascals out there with your YouTubes and your MySpaces and your MTVs, uh, you don't remember the days when basic cable on the weekend, when almost each channel um, would have their own late night movie show with little host segments in between. I'm not talking about Mystery Science Theater 3000 either. I'm talking about USA Up All Night. Um, TBS's Movies for Guys Who Like Movies, uh, Dinner in a Movie, also on TBS. Um, or one of my personal favorites, uh, arguably kind of the runner-up to USA Up All Night, for which one I actually started watching, uh, TNT's Monster Vision with Joe Bob Briggs. And oh, good old that, Joe Bob. Oh, yes. Oh, God. This, this is a format that needs to come back because, for the most part, 
what they would do is, well, let's face it, they would pick out some real schlock. Oh, yeah. Um, but, like, USA was notorious for for wanting to pick out movies with the word bikini in the title. Um, <laughs> I remember hey, bikini. It gets viewers. Yeah, yeah. Bikini car wash was all was always a favorite, um, especially any time on the one night of the two a week when Rhonda Shear was hosting USA Up All Night. Um, but occasionally you would tune in and they would actually have a block of really good movies. Like they would have the first couple, the first couple of Hellraiser movies, or the first couple of Friday the Thirteenth, or the first couple of couple of Child's Play movies. Well, I think the first time I ever saw Poltergeist was. God, I want to say it was on. I I want to say I think it was probably on USA Up All Night, um, and it's one of those that was a real favorite of basic cable because you didn't really need to edit it all that much. It's it's a horror movie, but it's really aside from the one scene you mentioned and maybe one or two others. It's scary, but it's atmospheric scary. It's not gory scary. I think its rating is PG. And to be fair, if yeah. it, and I can't remember if it came out before or after they instituted the PG-13 rating, but if that movie were to come out again today, I mean, you know, update a few of the a few of the, you know, effects and whatnot, but that'd still be, you know, do a shot for shot remake. It'd still be probably a PG movie. I mean, it's still it, it, it's it's scary, but the ground for years. Yeah. Well, you know, With, part of the problem there is they can't get, you know, it, it'd be so hard recasting the father role because Craig T. Nelson is pretty good in that role. Yeah, he uh, he's outstanding. He's uh, He really plays very down to earth. He never, he never hands it up terribly. Um, it's, it, it's almost a cliche to say it, but you feel like everything he's, ex- you really do kind of think to yourself, yeah. Yeah, that would be about the pants crapping I'd be giving myself in that situation. Yeah, and well, he also gets a couple of sardonic moments. Like, one of my favorites is when they invite the paranormal investigative crew, and I uh, never remember her name, the little, the small lady who, I'm going to hate myself for not remembering her name off the top of my head. Oh, God. Um, it Tangina. Not, I, mean, I, know, I, know it was Zel- I knew the actress, it's Zelda Rubenstein, but the character is uh, Tangina. But they mm-hmm. come into the house, and one of them is talking with Craig T. Nelson. He says, man, I recorded this really spooky sequence where a car moved across the kitchen floor, but it moved at such a rate that it was imperceptible. But after I set up the rec- – you had to watch the recording, and, you know, but there was nothing moving, and it just got all the way across the house, across the kitchen. He's like, yeah, that was awesome. And Craig T. Nelson's response is to just kind of sardonically open a door where things are flying around with <laughs> inside of it. They're hovering and – swirling, and everyone else just kind of stares at it, and he's like, yeah, this is what I've been dealing with. <laughs> you want to see imperceptible? Fuck your couch. We'll show you imperceptible. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I've seen some of the sequels, and, I mean, they're not bad in the way that other horror sequels are. I mean, <laughs> again, we could name names here, but there's a lot of bad horror sequels out there. Uh, Poltergeist 2 in particular, I didn't dislike that much. I mean, it's not great, but they took the uh, basic premise and they had a little fun with it. And they set it, I think it's two or three that set in a apartment building skyscraper and they have some fun with, you know, just all the things associated with that, you know, elevators, big you know, power outages, a lot of interesting stuff that they kind of play around with. And they really kind of attach to the first Poltergeist, like in name only, because they deal with a different set of issues than the first one does. The first one, the haunting occurs because the land of they a bunch of land has been developed into condos. It's going to be a nice, you know, one of those sub upper class upper middle class subdivision homes where everybody can be white collar and maybe a tad yuppie and be happy. And the land it was made on was an Indian burial ground, an Indian gravesite, and the Craig T. Nelson works for the development company or the realtors or something like that. He works for them. And they made a big – and he discovers that to cut cost and make the whole thing affordable, they didn't move the bodies. They just moved the headstones when they <laughs> relocated you didn't everything. Move the bodies! You didn't move the bodies! Yep, yep. And 
<laughs> oh God, that that is his Soylent Green is people line, and unfortunately. Because Craig T. Nelson is known completely for another role, I can't watch that now without wanting him to tag on at the end. Jeez, Luther! <laughs> oh, good old coach. Uh, I have a feeling I just lost about a third of our audience with that reference. <laughs> Don't worry too much about it. <laughs> but, yeah, yes. no, I, I, it's true. I mean, coach was kind of his defining role for so long, and you know, it, it's a credit to him that Outside of that one scene, the character where you want him to say, you know, geez, Luther, the rest of it, you don't really see Coach from the television series. He manages to be a different character. And, you know, good on Craig T. Nelson. The man needs more work. Doesn't get enough oh, work yeah. as far as. Yeah, yeah. He is, he is not Hayden Fox for the rest of this movie. And he really is a good actor. That, that really is the shame of this. Because, and I'm sure, I'm sure you're probably going to get deluged now with people who are going to be pointing out other things he's done. The only other thing I can think of right off the top of my head that that he was in was that he played a sleazy real estate developer in The Devil's Advocate. Uh, the other thing that I think of him in, and you're right about that one, but yeah, you also get Al Pacino as the devil in that one. So there's, mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, he plays a you know kind of sleazy big business executive in the. Um, a movie called The Company Men, which stars Ben Affleck and Tommy Lee Jones in the primary roles. And he's, again, big corporate, everything has to be downsized and whatnot. Kind of a bad guy, but, at the, but you know, again, just people out there, we, we're encouraging everyone to find more work for Craig T. Nelson. Oh, and yeah. And no, this is, not, this is not Peter Griffin with the whiteout saying, have you seen that episode of Family Guy? Oh, of course, of course. That's one of the... That's one of the um... Funnier moments of the first couple of seasons. Oh yeah, he spills wide out on the letter he wrote protesting the the fact that coach was canceled and the way the wide out fell on the page. Instead of saying what a, a well thought out, well reasoned letter, the only thing that was put out there was if you don't put coach back on the air, I will kill Craig T. Nelson. Craig T. Nelson <laughs> shows up at his doorstep after the letter's been delivered, gives him a handgun, and says, "Just make it quick." <laughs> And, you know, he actually seems like somebody who really should have had a better career in voice acting after well, coaching. Hey, we're, we're pulling for him here, and we'll start a petition or something to get the guy more work. But, uh, you know, you, you read about Poltergeist, and the best haunted house movies are not reliant on special effects or gore in the same way that other types of, specifically, you know, slashers or gore fest or splatter movies, you know, they rely on gore and being shocking and you wanting to see interesting kills where a haunted house movie, a good haunted house movie deals a lot more with atmosphere than it does with anything overtly violent. And that holds and true I, with, I, I, I think that's what, that's the reason why the poltergeist, why poltergeist two probably didn't work quite as well is because there's just something that's so much less intimidating about the haunted apartment. Yeah. Um, and if you, if you don't think that's true, ladies and gentlemen, there's a crappy sort of horror movie starring uh, Jennifer Connelly out there called Dark Waters, I believe. That was, of course, that's also one of the slew of American remakes of Japanese movies when a lot of the sensibilities don't translate. But the next one that we absolutely have to talk about, um, consistently ranked not just one of the best haunted building movies of all time, one of the better horror movies of all time. Uh, I think we need to talk about The Shining because... God bless Stanley Kubrick for that movie. So we, we, need, we need to talk about Stanley Kubrick's Shining, not that piece of shit that starred Brian from Wing. Uh, in the in defense of that movie or of the miniseries, it stays truer to the novel, and I actually find the novel a bit scarier than the Stanley Kubrick movie. But a lot of what Stephen King does in his writing doesn't necessarily translate all that well into you know, movies or television necessarily. Unless he writes specifically for that. He is. They'll tell you that. Yeah. But so just, uh, I want to get your impression, your thoughts on Stanley Kubrick's version of The Shining, because that's one of my favorites, absolutely, of all time. And it does it, again, through this really foreboding atmosphere as opposed to anything graphically violent. Honestly, I really yeah. don't think that movie works with any director except for Stanley Kubrick. I'd agree with that. I, I really, really don't. Um, because he does, Kubrick generates the atmosphere that we talk about so very well with so many shots that 
aren't big, aren't over the top. And, in fact, the big thing about them is so many of them are really fairly quiet. Um, it, it really does set a mood of, of desolation and un, uncomfortable tension that sets in over the entire over. One of my favorite scenes in the entire movie is um, Danny Torrance riding down the hall on his tricycle and no ambient music, very few cuts, just for the most part, just perspective, and you've got the sound amplified of him just roaring down the floor and then a few moments where he hits um, carpet or something and it goes kind of a little bit quieter and then he's back Well, it's just, you know, it, it put you to imagine a a young kid would do to pass the time in a hotel and yet it you just have this sense that uh, something bad's going to happen and, and for as much credit as we give as we give Jack Nicholson for how well he plays you know, a man who snapped and how over the top he is that really only works because of everything before it well I won't say only but largely because it uh, of how it contrasts with everything else around it um, and and how stark every everything is. Because if you had overdone it the way a lot of movies would today with lots of jump scares and a big overblown score, do you really think it would have been quite as effective? Oh, no. No way. Right. I mean... Well, but it also yeah. goes back to something that's, that's really kind of... that I really like about Haunted House movies, and that is the fact that there's really no way you can, unless you actually get out of the house... But you can actually escape anything because the house has so many different ways. It, um, it's it's not like an actual being, even a even a magical one. Literally, the entire thing surrounds you, and it's got ways of kind of compelling you to stay. So even then, getting away from it isn't quite as easy as it sounds. So, and in this case, you're, we're talking about an atmosphere in which you've got this massive, massive place. It's already got its own reputation probably kind of settling on Jack's, on Jack Torrance's mind, but that has got just so much all around it that it can, that it can use to harm these people. Um, it, it really is a sense of how do you, I mean, how do you, how do you survive it? Yeah, and that's one of the things that I like about the novel as well as the movie, that you get the sense that you know, the house can do things to you. In the Kubrick movie, the, the place itself, I mean, yes, Jack Torrance goes crazy, and that's all kinds of scary and whatnot. But one of the things that, and it kind of bothered me the way they did it in the uh, TV miniseries, was when the little kid Danny was out playing in the uh, maze, uh, the hedge maze. Because in the book, that's a very intimidating, very tense scene, because he knows something is coming after it. And they wa that whole sequence wound up not being in the movie for one reason or another, and... It wasn't as good when they did it in the miniseries, and it's like, and it just it adds so much to the tension when, you know, you're not safe anywhere within that place. It can do all kinds of things to mess with you. Well, and and psychologically, you always think of a house of a building as as possibly being a kind of a shelter. Well, what do you do when the shelter is your enemy? Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty crazy, and it's actually one of the things. I like a and you know if you're a fan of the book and you watch the movie you know, they are very kind of separate entities in that they're approached differently they're they have some fundamental differences within the stories that they tell which is not a bad thing I mean I love the movie so I'm not you know I'm not comparing them to say which one is better I'm just pointing out that there are some differences because in the novel he it ends with the hotel being blown up Horribly mangled, the security shed gets burned down too. I mean, the whole thing just gets destroyed. And in the movie, you know, it, it kind of wins because it gets Jack to sit out there in the middle of the hedge maze and die of exposure. And he gets to join the ranks of the hotel and whoever has to care for it next season when it goes out of commission because you know they're going to do it again. And all the while, his urge to kill is fading, fading, fading. Fading. Oh, God. <laughs> Come, family. Let's bask in TV's warm, glowing, glowing. <laughs> oh, God bless this. But, yeah, that, and, you know, again, a good, and I want to kind of contrast the next two movies I want to talk about here because you know, we talked about, you know, 
atmosphere being a huge part of what makes a haunted house story good. I mean, it, it's basically all that holds the paranormal activity, the first two ones together, is the atmosphere. Because it, for people who criticize it for being boring, I don't think that's a valid complaint. At the same time, I understand that it's not fast-paced with a lot of cuts, so people with short attention spans probably wouldn't care for it all that much. But again, it's the atmosphere that goes with it is what makes it and what keeps you invested. And... One of the better, a good atmosphere-based haunted house story is the original The Haunting. Not for, uh, not the 1999 remake. Uh, which, no, not both Owen Wilson and Captain Zeta-Jones. God, no, not that one. Here's my problem with that. I want to like the 99 remake. I do, for a couple of reasons. One, it has Liam Neeson in it, and Liam Neeson is awesome. Two, Owen Wilson dies. Owen Wilson dying is a good thing. Always. But the whole the whole movie, it doesn't have the tension, especially later into the movie. I mean, initially you get some fun moments that kind of play up the tension about what's going on. But it, like a third of the way into the movie, you've lost all of it. I mean, there's no more tension. It's just awkwardness. And it still has some fun sequences. I mean, the sequence where Owen Wilson gets decapitated is awesome. I, I love that sequence. And... The poor guy trying to ram the gate with his car, and it just doesn't work, because that only works in movies. But that movie also kind of falls under just the weight of how much special effects it tried to work in there. When, if you look at the original, you don't need special effects. Not a whole lot of them. You don't need all of the CGI or the awkwardness that kind of comes about with some of that. And there's a reason the original stands up to this day even though it was made in 1963, it's still a really good haunted house movie, and it still is pretty scary. And it's just sad that the remake failed to capture the spirit of the original. So you I know, wanted to get... No, go ahead. Well, well, yeah, let's... Yeah, let's. I, I was going to jump in and kind of bring up a movie that I wanted to, uh, that I wanted to bring up. Um, in this oh, by subject. all means. Uh, well... And I don't know, maybe we can kind of talk about them both at once, because actually, and there are people who might disagree with me on this, they might not, but somewhere kind of right around that, remind me, when did when did the remake of The Haunting come out? 1999. Okay, 1999. So, okay, yeah, actually, um, and it might have even been from the same company, now that I think about it, this, this, it might have been from Dark Castle. Um, about, oh, it was one... Two years later, um, another movie came out that was also a remake of an older Haunted House movie. Uh, it was drastically different from the first one. Drastically, drastically different. And yet, it is one of my favorite scary movies to watch this time of year. In fact, I'm due to get it out and watch it any time now. And that is 13 Ghosts. Um, uh, the re the remake came out in 2001, so yeah, just two years later. The re remake came out in 2001. And you know what? Let's, uh, to give the devil its due, yes, that's another one wherein they did depend a lot on special effects, but the thing is, is a great deal of it, a great deal of the action in the movie was practical effects. Um, it was makeup. It was done with an actual with an actual dynamic set. And it shows. It, it it really does. It shows in that you get so much more out of the performances of the actors themselves, um, out of people actually playing the part and actually reacting to what's around them, rather than what you can tell is somebody that's acting to a green or acting towards somebody just directing them, okay, this is where the special effect is. So just you know, use your imagination and pretend you're seeing that. Um, it's it's, it's kind of like the Evil Dead movies in that it's that power of of getting the performance out of the actors with what you're supposed to be scared of actually being there. CGI can be done well, but it's got to be used sparingly and with a really fine touch, especially in a haunted house. So that's why you can take a movie like 13 Goes that's so action-packed and and has a much faster pace than The Haunting. And it's actually good as opposed to The Haunting just being, well, like you said, you're only thrilled that you get out of it being the fact that 
for once, you wished Owen Wilson was dead, and it came true. Hey, any movie that Owen Wilson dies becomes one of my favorites. It's one of the reasons I like the movie Armageddon so much, because he dies on that. And I, I keep forgetting, did Owen Wilson die in Anaconda? He did. He was eaten by the snake. It was glorious. I was I, I was gonna say it's been so long since I've seen that. I know that I know that uh I know that Carrie Werner died, I know that John Boyd died, I know that but I wasn't sure if Owen died. Oh yeah, he died. Uh no, at the end like Jennifer Lopez and Ice Cube both get to live, which is kind of depressing, but In fact, what are you now do? that I think about it, I really am glad Owen died because Owen got to bump uglies with Kari. <laughs> Oh, they I were out in the up. jungle on the road. war chase. I, I screwed up so badly on Long Road to Ruin on Tuesday, I feel obligated to say something positively lecherous about Kari. So, anyway. Um, yeah. But, but no, yeah, I, yeah, I completely that's, agree that's, with you. You know, Practical yeah. effects, <laughs> especially in horror movies, are so important. It's not that you can't have and use CGI. I mean, by all means, it's there for a reason. But And we'll get into this more... Uh, next Tuesday on the long road to ruin, but when you start looking at all the CGI that they put into various Hellraiser movies, that helps kill everything associated with it. Oh, God. Yeah, um, yeah, I still maintain the CGI in Hellraiser 2 was actually one of the more underwhelming parts of that movie. Yeah, I can. but at the same time, when you get CGI that's done well, it adds to the movie. And I, while I'll agree it was a little underwhelming, at the same time, it wasn't jarring and took you out of the moment like other CGI moments and other sequels that we will be discussing at length. <laughs> well, well, yeah, because then, of course, then we get Hellworld, which is supposed to have everything to do with the Hellraiser MMO, and when you see the actual game, you look at it and go, this is the worst video game in history. It's Yeah, that's, uh, how that spawned any number of people being interested in it with the gameplay that they had was just oh sad but we'll get to that again next Tuesday um, not this coming one uh, not the 15th but the 22nd we will be finishing the Hellraiser work which will be amusing to say the least um, but back on kind of track here one of the ones that I might get a little flack for bringing up in some ways uh, I want to talk about the Vincent Price The House on Haunted Hill and one of the reasons I say I might get some flack for that is the house isn't actually haunted. It's just Vincent Price screwing with people, which is still awesome because it's Vincent Price. Mm -hmm. But that's another one that I feel does a good job of building up atmosphere and establishing that, okay, here's – especially like the fir first person dies and then Vincent Price dies. And like, wait, no, what? I mean, we're here to see Vincent Price. Why did he die? And, you know, who can you trust? And they mix the haunted elements with a bunch of paranoia and who done it, and, uh, of course – finished off with the great scene of Vincent Price gliding the skeleton at the guilty party until they, like, have a heart attack. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, and that was, that was really the great thing about all the William Castleman, all of those, all of those one set movies. But the fact that you really couldn't rely on it. You really had to do everything with timing and performance and, and atmosphere, and just the set being able to stand up. Um, and you can tell because, amazingly, the same company that made 13 Ghosts, I think prior to making 13 Ghosts, actually, did their remake of House on Haunted Hill. And, um, that one, and the one really awesome zoetrope scene with Jeffrey Rush aside, it's just a big mishmash of obvious CGI, crappy performances by annoying performers, for the most part. Again, Jeffrey Rush and... You could argue the scenery chewing Famke Jansen aside. Um, but then you also got slapped at the end with the, the horrible manifestation of the evil of the house. Yeah. It, can we just please do away with the whole idea of the evil is just a big evil cloud of black billowy smoke and evilness? Oh, but it's so easy to portray. And besides, Lost did it. Yeah, and Lost did it better. I can't believe I'm saying that about anything on Lost. On Lost. After, after about the first three or four seasons. But, yeah, Lost did it better. You got outdone by Lost, you stupid chucklehead. Oh, <laughs> like, that's always fun. Uh, I mean, what, 
what is it? What is the black cloud supposed to be? Is it, why a black cloud? Is it just? Is it like art? Yeah, who knows? Uh, just it, it, give me that movie. Just give me flatulence of Satan. <laughs> <laughs> the asylum will now come out with it, or either the asylum or some uh, sci-fi original. You say yeah, and you say that like a movie called Monster wasn't made, and then a movie ripping off Monster called Septic Man. No, no, I know. Uh, believe me, I know. The <laughs> horror fans have to suffer through a lot of crappy stuff. Rimshot. Well, we suffer, we suffer through a lot of crappy stuff because for some reason it's like if Hollywood, if somebody who makes these movies would actually have some conversations with actual with actual horror fans, they would get a pretty good idea of what is actually scary. On the other yeah. hand, they seem to have this idea all their own, this bubble of it, and it's like. It's like they all become Vince McMahon when they go to make a horror movie, and they insist that nobody is going to tell them what makes a good movie because nobody knows better. Than them. Yeah. And um, so there's that, a couple of other ones I want to get yeah. in here. I don't know if you saw the, um, at least a couple of years ago. Let me find the exact year if I can. Uh, I'll get to it in a minute. A few years ago, uh, 2007, there. Uh, the Spanish language filled in The Orphanage. No, I never saw that. I would encourage you and anyone who hasn't seen it to look it up. I mean, the caveat there is you have to not mind reading subtitles, but it's a heavily atmospheric-based uh, haunted location. Uh, again, this orphanage is haunted, and it's based on atmosphere and a couple of weird images that are not I mean, they're creepy, but again, there's like there's almost no violence or blood or gore. And when a movie is able to be scary without all of that, you know, it's just a testament to how well it's made. I uh, are there any others that jump out to you that we haven't touched on? Oh, I can't believe you're not touching on Amity. But... Oh yes, I make an effort to try and ignore that as much as possible. But <laughs> okay. Legal disclaimer, ladies and gentlemen, personal disclaimer. I don't care much for the Amityville horror movie. No. I find them a bit slow. I find them not very scary, especially the original, and I didn't care much for the one with Ryan Reynolds because, hey, Ryan Reynolds is being Ryan Reynolds. Who'd have thought? <laughs> but they, you, there are people that enjoy them, and I don't fault you for enjoying them. I mean, here I, here I am you know, saying how much I like the Paranormal Activity movies, especially the first two, and they're based entirely on pacing and atmosphere and not a whole lot happening at once. Then at the same time, it's like, oh, wait, there's nothing happening until the door slams shut on the kid's, and the window shuts on the kid's finger. I mean, so, you know, it, it comes down to personal taste in a lot of ways as far as Amityville goes for me, at least. But people out there like it, and again, some of the sequels are better than the original. I mean, I think two was better than the original, but so, yeah. You're right. We do need to talk about the Amityville horror and the true events that inspired it. Dun dun dun. Uh, no, no, no. The completely fraudulent <laughs> event. That's that's one that I can't believe people still believe because the word's kind of been out on that for a while, and it it's kind of one of the reasons why I didn't really want to see The Conjuring because even though I heard it was really scary, and I know I'll end up getting over my prejudices and probably seeing it when it comes out on DVD. Yeah, um, they tried. You should. You know, they, yeah, they tried to build it up on that, on it being uh, based on the people who investigated the true events that inspired the Amityville horror, um, which, by the way, you know, not to poke too many holes in everybody's canoe out there, yes, the Warrens for years have been written off as frauds um, for the entire for the entire Amityville hoax. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Speaking of just The Conjuring, it is good. It's a nice, scary, uh, atmospheric. It's it, it's good. Uh, I would encourage you to see it when it comes out on DVD or becomes available on Netflix. Or if you're not morally minded, I'm sure there are other avenues that you could pursue. At a bottle of rum. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead and talk about the original, you know, the Amityville horror movies for a little bit because. It, because they really are, we kind of have to, because they really are a little bit of a They're curiosity. one of the quintessential, you know, they're kind of the big budget haunted house movies as far as things starting off at least. I mean, they it kind of got the ball rolling. But, but that's the amazing thing, though, is the fact that despite the fact that, as you pointed out, and I agree with you, for the most part, the movies are not really that good. For some reason, the iconic scares of it seem to hold up really well, and it's 
unusually fondly remembered by people. Um, and and it always and it always seems to come up in the discussion of great horror movies until somebody actually says, "What? No, no, this is not a good movie. In fact, this is a bad, really boring movie." You know, the remake was quasi bearable, I guess. It was but, scarier than the original. I'll give it that, well, but yeah, once once you get past Van Wilder, oh, good old Ryan Reynolds. He plays Ryan but, Reynolds in every movie. But no, but, uh, but Robert, maybe you can tell me something I'm missing here. Why is it that this is so fondly remembered by people when so, when the original in particular is just so fucking bad? Especially since there is a sequel in which people are haunted by a lamp. You know, I think this is one of those occasions where people saw it originally and you kind of got swept up in the discussion of, you know, this is what, it's based on true events, this really happened, and again, you have to remember that the original came out, oh, I forget when, give me a second, I'll continue my thought, but the original came out before social media, before the internet, before cable television, Uh, the original came out in 1979, there we go, and it just had so again you had this you had the theme and the expression of you know this is based on true events this really happened and people got into it because they had no real reason to disbelieve it and it and so a lot of people kind of got in with that and you know we mentioned that there are some good moments in it i mean you take the movie on the whole yeah i i think it's boring and not a lot happens but some of the iconic scares the key with those is you have to look at them like the minute or so before they happen to kind of get the atmosphere that you want and then have it happen and then move on because you know, leading up to the iconic scares from it it's boring and they don't more than that they don't establish the atmosphere all that well because when the atmosphere is established you are on the edge of your seat you are anticipating something happening which for my money is better than your average jump scare any day of the week. But you had, so you had, you know, this happened to real people before that became the tagline on every Hollywood movie. You had some good scares. You had, and again, taken independently of everything else, you had some decent scares. And you had a good, I mean, the house that they used for it, the exterior, you know, the shot with the eyes, you know, the windows on either side of the chimney. You had some good moments, but at the same time, I kind of feel it's one of those movies that everyone says they like, so you kind of say you like it too. And yeah. that happens with that happens with all kinds of things. It happens with, you know, pro wrestling matches or events and MMA fights and boxing fights, movies, books. It's one of those things that everyone seems to fondly remember and it I almost think it's because everyone else says they like it, so you say you like it. You know what? Actually, the last time I remember feeling that way wasn't about a horror movie. It was about the fucking Great Gatsby. Movie or book? Well, kind of, in a way, a combination of both. Because I remember when the latest movie version was getting set to come out. Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah, and it was... And, oh, for fuck's sake, nobody would shut the fuck up about it. And I was just left going... I didn't like the novel when I read it in high school. I didn't really think it was all that interesting. It's one of those uh, that I think I have to reread, because I read it in high school, and... I think there were a lot of my teenage prejudices present, so I might have to reread it just to read it with a different perspective. But I give you, when I read it, it was just like, okay, I get it. There's, I mean, I get that he's basically mocking the over-the-top spending and the avarice and glut of everything's great that came about from the 20s, and I get that he's mocking that and showing why it's a bad thing. But see, and that's and that's the thing about it, though, is it's one of those movies wherein. Everybody and everything involved in it, everybody was just absolutely soiling themselves over it. From Baz Luhrmann is a genius, no he's not, to Leonardo DiCaprio is one of the greatest actors of our time. Only if by greatest you mean most overrated. Yeah, I'd together, probably go top 20. But and, to, and together they're starring in one of the greatest, they're starring in a remake of the great American novel. It was dry, boring, and there is not a single really likable character in the entire thing. You just kind of want it to end with everybody dying. And oh, I just only. <laughs> and I just didn't really buy the hype. And and as a result, I never bothered really getting out to see it. 
Um, I haven't seen it either. I'm just not that interested. I Well, I read a couple of reviews from people whose opinion I tend to agree with, and I just kind of looked at what they said and thought, you know, that was kind of my – those were kind of my uh, impressions from the trailers and everything, so I'll just – Well, exactly, and that's – you know, and really everything I just said, I just realized – Everything I just said about that, I can't say that about any of the Amityville movies because nobody thinks Ryan Reynolds is one of his generation's great actors. In fact, everybody seems to pretty much share your opinion, and the opinion gets even harsher if you talk to DC Comics fans and ask them, so what did you really think about Green Lantern? Um, oh, you ever want to have fun with uh, with someone who's into you know, Marvel Comics? Don't ask them, or you know, don't just ask them about Green Lantern. Ask them about his portrayal of Hannibal King. <laughs> Hey, look, when we did when we did vampires here uh, on on everyone loves a bad guy, I had Pat Mullen on and he had a pretty decent rant on Ryan Reynolds butchering the character of Hannibal King and everyone associated with allowing him to butcher the character of Hannibal King. Okay, you know what? And I'm one of the few people that cuts Blade Trinity a little bit slack, and I will tell you why. It's because. Depending on who you want to blame, you can cast a lot, a lot of blame on why that movie was so bad on David Goyer, Wesley Snipes, or both of them. Because Yeah, there's a lot. Well, I mean, any time a movie has as many alternate endings as that one did, you know something got screwed up in the, well, 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 but, but here's the along thing, the way. The, the thing you have to remember is... Um, Wesley didn't like Goyer because he felt like the movie was going to be, and as it turned out, he was right. However, whereas a lot of other actors would take chicken shit and try to make it into chicken salad, uh, Wesley made as much of a prima donna of himself as possible, according to everybody involved with that movie. Um, just did everything he could to make it an absolute spectacle. Um, taunting Goyer, communicating with Goyer only via post-it notes, um, hiding this trailer and getting high most of the time, to the point to where a lot of the movie had to be edited around it um, to kind of to make some things work. That's why you get a lot of the oddly placed static reaction shots. Um, and apparently it happened that way right up until Goyer pulled a somewhat infamous stunt in which um, he employed some biker friends of his to come to set and uh, masquerade as his security. And Finally, I guess that scared enough the crap out of Wesley that he managed to become marginally more cooperative, and they at, and they at least managed to finish the movie. Um, <laughs> how, how, so it depends really on who you want to blame. Do you blame David Goyer for probably not the best choice of directors for it, or do you blame Wesley for not playing ball and just trying to make the best of a bad situation? Um and yes, you can also cast a lot of that onto Ryan being all jokey jokey as Hannibal King. Uh, and just I will be all having just one face. Yeah, yeah, there's that too. But on the other hand, then you look triple at Triple H Bill. showing up with metal fangs. Oh fucking Triple H. Fucking A. This, and this the random random goth girl who's supposed to be leading the bad guys a Interesting concept, but poorly executed version of Dracula. I mean, just, there's so much wrong oh. with that. <laughs> yeah, even yeah, even Parker Posey couldn't save this. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, moving back towards topic. Yeah, I, I was going to say, in with Amityville, you really can't even blame anything like that. You just kind of have to just wonder, what went wrong? Because it seemed like there were some good things going on there. Yeah, it it's this odd thing with... I think all of those movies, I haven't seen some of the sequels in long enough time that I can't say specifically as far as this goes, but as far as those movies, it seems like you get a bunch of interesting parts and just lots of nothing in between them. And I don't know if that's writing, direction, or, you know, it's one of those things that's difficult to lay blame on, but you get, you know, a few good parts here and there, and you get a lot, but just... I mean, especially the original. There's a lot of nothing going on, and well, I mean, the and, and the remake had kind of the same thing. There was not as much boring stuff in the remake, but again, you had good parts, and then a lot of just you know wall of text to get through to the next good part that didn't seem to do anything other than bore you to. And and to kind of pander right along with the Ryan Reynolds haters, yes, I I gotta remember this is the guy that the very first time. 
I ever saw an ad for him in a movie. It was for Van Wilder. And I remember, at first, mistaking him for Jason Lee. Okay. Yeah, they do share some facial similarities. Facial similarities. They sound kind of alike in speaking sometimes. So, yeah, in a roundabout way, I just kind of have to think, well, let's see. What would Jason Lee trying to lead a horror movie be like? And I just kind of go, oh, fuck. Never mind, it, folks. I kind of... Now. In deference to Jason Lee, he might be able to do a decent job of being, even kind of carrying a horror movie if, but nowadays he got a bit more range under his belt lately, but in general, no, that's not, not the best. Yeah, yeah, he, he went to actually display some range in a couple of movies. He was, he was relatively good in Vanilla Sky, actually. Uh, but, <laughs> hell, actually, now that I really think about it, he might have been preferable for this movie over Ryan. Well... I think Jason Lee has the ability to not just be Jason Lee in front of the camera. Yeah, yeah. Which is kind of the knock on Ryan Reynolds, and I know there are Ryan Reynolds fans out there who are probably going to get on me about this, but I have never seen a movie with Ryan Reynolds where he does not play Ryan Reynolds. You know what? The only one where I would contest you on that, I've got to give him credit, Buried was not bad. Um, oh, that's the one where like the whole movie is him and he's buried alive, right? Uh, yeah, most uh, most like ninety nine, ninety eight percent of the movie is Ryan Reynolds in a coffin. Okay, uh, I yeah. haven't seen. I remember the previews for and everything for that, and it just I I didn't pass because it was Ryan Reynolds. I kind of passed on that because I think there were maybe three actors in the world who I would be okay watching just them on screen for the entire time. And, again, that's not to knock Ryan Reynolds. There are some legitimately talented actors who fall into, no, I don't want to see you on screen for the entire time. Yeah, yeah. But, but give it a try sometime. It's Okay, it's I will. Nothing, I'll... It's, yes, it's nothing earth-shattering, but it's um, it's an intriguing concept right out the gate. And then once you actually watch it, and you, know, you realize that for the most part, he's acting with himself. Uh, Tom Hanks, he's not, but he manages to make it a, a pretty enjoyable about 90 minutes. Um, also, Tom Hanks does not fall into that list of guys I want to watch on screen for the whole time. Well, you know, obviously, what you're um, No, I like Castaway. I mean, but at the same time, you got scenes that were not just him. Right, right. But speaking of doing of doing more with a lot less, you know, we got to talk about three out of the four Evil Dead movies. Oh yeah, yeah, we can we can definitely talk about those. Yeah, we'll um, we'll we'll obviously Army of Darkness. You don't fit the theme, so you know we'll just you're wonderful and we everything. Love you. But, yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. But we're just going to set you aside while we talk about the three movies about the haunted. Okay. Now, I got this from some other people, and I. I, cause, okay, I went to like a midnight showing of the new Evil Dead, which was awesome. But yeah. I went into it understanding that this is not going to be full of fun and games. This is not going to be jokey. There's not. They're attempting to update the original Evil Dead, which was a straight horror movie. And I, a, I think a bunch of the people in the theater with me, I, I went with my brother and one of our mutual friends, and we had a good time. But I think other people were like, wait, where's the jokes? And... No, the original Evil Dead is straight, unrelenting horror. It, the original doesn't hold up well uh, nowadays. If you if you go watch the original, it's I don't think it's anything specific. I mean, some of the effects don't hold up as well, which is part of the problem. And there's one, there's a couple of extended sequences where there's not a lot happening. Well, I, I, it's not like there's nothing happening. There's just not a whole lot, and just a lot of it doesn't hold up. As far as what they were going for, it was great for the time. But the new Evil Dead was basically what the original one was, you know, 20 years earlier. Well, and let's let's face it, the original one was more or less just, you could almost call it kind of a dress rehearsal for Evil Dead. Yeah, that yeah, that yeah, that's a legitimate. Yeah. Um, but but you I know, love, the, uh, this is something that both 1, 2, and the new one got right. They did a great job of creating an atmosphere of... Bad stuff is happening. You know, you can't go out because the trees will rape you. I mean, it's kind of a funny thing to say, but when it actually happens and you think about it, and you take a minute to think about it, you go, that's, that's serious stuff. And the only bridge over there is just out, and you can't get out. 
it's yeah, it, it's a pretty scary set of circumstances. Mm-hmm. Um, well, the only the only small little quibble I have with that is in the first Evil Dead. For those of you who haven't seen the movies yet, and just to kind of give those of you who have seen them both something to agree with, in the first one, you could argue that the tree rape sequence was hard to take seriously. In a little fact, bit, yeah. Yeah, and in fact, it's just kind of there because tree rape. That's why. Um, on the, the other the hand, the new Evil Dead movie does that much better. It's actually kind of gross and scary and intense. It it goes in a much more sinister direction with the actual sequence, and it actually serves a purpose to the plot too. Yeah. It 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 actually moves things forward. So. It's not there just to have a fairly attractive young woman violated by the local flora. Yeah. So. But you know, kind of moving on into the second, and I think, I think the first two, uh, not the new one, but the original Evil Dead and Evil Dead Two: Dead by Dawn. I think they're on Netflix streaming right now. Are indeed. Which just makes me like that makes me so happy. <laughs> right. But two does a lot of what the first two is kind of a retelling of one with a few added elements. And you get some fewer characters, which actually works in this particular content. And you get a lot of Ash trying to deal with the... I mean, the sequence when he starts laughing and all of the taxidermied animals around the room start laughing with him, you're not sure if the house is mocking him or if he's actually going crazy. Well, and and speaking of the taxidermy scene, as silly as it might look now by our standards of, of effects, what I, one of the best things about this movie is it works so well with, like I said, with so little, because they're still doing just about everything practical. You know, um, it's every every bump you see Bruce Campbell take, that's actually Bruce taking it. Everything he's actually reacting to, well, he's actually, from for a vast majority of the movie, he's actually reacting to what's actually there. Which is a testament to, despite the fact that he's, his career has mostly been limited to kind of to kind of cult stuff. Bruce that means a cameo in every Sam Raimi movie ever. Exactly. Yeah, that too. Hey, his Bruce? cameo in Spider-Man Three is hands down the best part of that whole movie. That's not saying much. Hey, Bruce Campbell is awesome. No, 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 no. That's not what I mean. I know, I know. I, the, the three has a plethora of issues, but. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure you listened to the Long Road to Ruin episode where where Mark and I actually got into quite a spirited debate about that one. Um, uh, you know, I think it has issues, but I don't think it's the worst thing ever. And yeah, I did hear your debate on that, and I was highly entertained by it. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it's it's what it really is one of those where if you're a fan of the old stuff, someone who's watched stuff like Evil Dead and Evil Dead. Two, and marvel at how they did everything practically. Or you watched the original Nightmare on Elm Street, and you realized that that entire scene with Freddy and Visage pushing against the wall was done entirely with spandex. You look at it, and you look how simply and how effectively a lot of this stuff was done, and then you look at modern horror movies, and you just go, what about this is so damn complicated? Yeah, I mean... Uh, that's one of the reasons I was disappointed in the Nightmare on Elm Street remake, because those movies have always had fun special effects to them, and it's one of the things that has made Freddy so interesting over the years, is his is what you can do in movie making with him and his abilities. And then they went and had just nothing of real interest going on with the CGI. It's just... Oh, uh, you know. But we'll get... Yeah, yeah. Freddie gets his own podcast, and I have no doubt that in the near future on the Long Road to Ruin, we'll be touching on the Nightmare on Elm Street series. Well, yeah, especially especially since we know that you are nowhere near done coming back for extended stretch as guest co-host. Um, no, and I'm looking it, forward to it. But, okay, to yeah, kind of wrap this up, uh, any haunted house movies that we haven't touched on that you just want to give a quick shout-out to? You know, actually, yes. Now that you mention it, I would be absolutely remiss if I didn't mention one of what has in a fairly short order become one of my all-time favorite on a location, Grave Encounters. If you have not seen it's on Netflix. It's, it's there for streaming. It's there on DVD. By all means, go watch it. Uh, because I always say found, found footage is always, almost, well, almost always, completely hit 
I say almost it's always. It's always hit or miss. The question is whether or not the movie is a hit or a miss. Well, well, no, that's well, yeah, that's exactly what I what I mean, Captain Redundant. Um, um, and I say almost always because I'm one of the people who can acknowledge the flaws of Cloverfield, but I still enjoy, still enjoy it today. Um, uh, yeah, I my problem with Cloverfield, and uh, I saw it on a midnight showing, and apparently the lovely people at the theater thought it was a good idea to turn off the air condition. Mm. So you combined being a bit hot and stuffy with shaky cam and a fair amount, and there were a fair number of people there. It There were some people there who were physically sick because of that particular combination of events. Well, I mean, to to get back to Grave Encounters, though. Yeah. Um, you, when you watch this, you have to keep in mind that, yes, Obviously, it is one big square kick in the balls to the to the glut of um, paranormal investigation reality shows. In particular, it's very obvious that it's taking specific aim at ghost adventures, which anybody who's ever watched it will tell you is one of the most laughable things ever. Um, it. <laughs> that, that's another one that I, I think the docu the original documentary movie is on Netflix. Uh, just go watch it. Go watch it. Watch all two hours of the the host Zach Bagans doing his obviously worst Ashton Kutcher impression ever, and tell me you wouldn't watch a movie taking a piss out of this taking the piss out of this concept. Um, however, the actual scares are executed really well, and what I remember most about it was when I watched it, it got to the part where the scares were really kind of starting to ramp up. And I thought, well, God, this movie went fast. How much of this? How much of this is left? This is unfortunately, this is really good, but it's got to be the climax. Of all this has got to be. And I looked and I realized, holy shit, there's like 30 minutes of this left. Um, and it, amazingly, I, I remember watching this in broad daylight and actually and actually being like on the edge of my seat, tense about the whole thing. Um, seriously, go give it. Go give it a shot because it's one of the few times that that concept is actually seemingly executed with some thought without too much of the shaky cam, and with even, believe it or not, for a found footage movie, pretty decent special effects. Um, however, uh, if you go watch Grave Encounters 2 after that, I am not holding myself at all responsible for the face palming that is going to ensue. Yeah, uh, sequel not so good, original very good. All right, well, that's going to wrap up our discussion of haunted locations for the time being. It's a subject that will probably be revisited again somewhere down the road as more haunted movies or other locations uh, come to mind. I mean, none of these are final. I mean, there's a good chance I'll do another Slashers one down the road at some point, too. Uh, is there anything you want to plug for this particular week, Sean? Well, let's see here. This coming late Sunday night slash Monday morning, make sure to check out the 411mania.com music zone and my album retrospective column, uh, Give Life Back Music. We're going to be wrapping up our look at John Mayer this week with his two most recent albums, and I'm going to announce who the next artist that I'm going to be taking a look at. It's going to be a bit of a surprise for the 411 crowd. And the next thing that we, that I've really got to plug is oh let's see date was twelfth twenty second is next is the yeah. Tuesday for Long Road to Ruin yes October twenty second uh, nine p.m. Eastern time six p.m. Mountain time uh, tune in right here on Blog Talk Radio to Long Road to Ruin because Robert and I are going to be wrapping up our look at the Hellraiser franchise by looking at well. The bad but and the seen, horrible. And would have to improve greatly to be considered bad. Um, yeah. One that is it starts going bad to, and goes downhill rapidly. Yeah. Put it to you another way, kids. It's one that is a. It's one that is absolutely guaranteed, and I have in fact actually guaranteed it to send me into one of the most epic screaming, cursing rants in the history of the one year we have been doing this show, and. Keep in mind, folks, uh, always keep in mind, nobody complains like a fan. A, because it's I hate Fury. A, because I hate Hellraiser. It's because I love Hellraiser, and I hate what this what this did to the name value of the franchise. So please tune in to what is bound to be 
also be one of my all-time favorite episodes. Yeah, and I look forward to having to listen to that live and try to break up the rant every now and then, or encourage it. I'm weird like that. Um, For my plugs, uh, you can listen to me every Sunday at 9 p.m. Eastern on the 411 Ground and Pound radio show. Coming to you this Sunday, we're going to review UFC Fight Night 29, which the review itself might put me to sleep because a lot of the fights sure did. And we'll also be... We'll also be previewing um, the upcoming pay-per-view event, the third fight between Cain Velasquez and Junior Dos Santos, which I am certainly looking forward to, especially Wednesday's event. Uh, My column on 411 Mania goes live every Friday, is locked in the guillotine. I have one up right now where I discuss why the UFC was right in cutting Husamar Palharis after his win, uh, reviewing the rest of the fight card from UFC Fight Night 29, and... News tidbits here and there. Uh, Stefan Struve keeps getting better, so good for him. And all kinds of, you know, any big news, I like to cover it because it's fun. And again, the next week I will be rev- I will be breaking down the upcoming pay-per-view event, so I get to break down Dos Santos versus Velasquez in great detail, which is always fun for me because I like analyzing fights. And a big one like that's always a good time. But that's going to wrap it up. Um, next week, the 18th, uh, the Everyone Loves a Bad Guy will be back. And we're going to be taking a look at the classics of horror, the the you know 20s and 30s universal monster movie. And, Sean, I hope you'll join me for that one as well. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm watching in between the Hellraiser movies to break up the shivs. Yeah. So come back and we'll talk about Dracula, Do- Drac- Do- Dracula's daughter, if I can get it out right, The Wolfman, The Wolfman Returns, Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein, Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. All of it. We're going to cover it all, and it's going to be awesome. I'm looking forward to that one. I know Sean is as well. And all of those movies, I think, except Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, stream on Netflix. So feel free to watch them. And, oh, yes, and The Mummy and its various sequels as well, because mummies can be scary, I promise. <laughs> all right, that's going to do it for us tonight. Thanks for listening in. For Sean Comer, who writes in the Music Zone and loves The Long Road to Ruin, he helped found it. And for myself, I have still the great soundbite to say goodnight to, and I'll remind you guys just to thank the bad guys in your life, because a little darkness makes the light seem brighter. Good night, folks. So say goodnight to the bad guys.